Well, good morning, Lyon County. Yes, good morning, Lyon County. <laughs> good morning. <laughs> good morning, Millie. Hey, we're here uh, missing Cheryl. She's out on assignment this morning. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Craig Johnson alongside Millie Krull, and we are here at the Lyon County News, home of the Lyon County News Extra Radio Edition, which you're listening in to right now. Tuned in to Lyon County News, Lyon County Local News here from Lyon County News Headquarters at Lyon County News. Right. If you don't have it by now, this is the Lyon County News Radio Extra (laughs) Edition, and uh, we've got a lot of stuff going on here in the news world want to welcome you aboard for this episode. Today, uh, we're going to talk a little bit about crazy days. We're kind of in the midst of crazy days, almost toward the tail end of it almost. Lots of good bargains uptown. Lots of good stuff going on, and uh, you'll want to check those things out. If you come to town, um, kids, if you bring your dad or grandpa to the barber shop, (coughs) there's a crazy barber in the basement there, (laughs) and... uh, if you bring your dad or grandpa, he's got a bag of candy for you, and it's safe candy. I checked it out myself. Uh, Jameson, if you see him, he's got a snazzy new haircut and looking good. If you're listening, Jameson, looking good, buddy. Hey, uh, we've got Cheryl on assignment. She's at the school right now, and there are um, there are a lot of things going on at the school. She's taking some pictures of that and so she is uh watching out for that i'll uh i'll uh take your take your wire over top of your mic there right in front there there that'll help i'll unmute your mic there now so (laughs) welcome back to the broadcast booth here millie thank you a lot of good stuff going on here in the paper so we're looking at volume 112 number 18 of the paper this morning and uh, a lot of good stuff going on. I want to wish the uh, GLR musicians the best of luck. Have a great performance. They're going to the large, the state large group music festival on Friday. That's tomorrow, and that'll be in the evening. You're welcome to go and join them. I think you'll have to pay admission at the door. And uh, we've got some pictures from the concert that they just had this week at the high school. The high school uh, choir and band did an awesome, awesome job with their spring concert. Also got uh, three senior spotlights in the paper this week, a bunch of FFA banquet pictures. I think you took those pictures, didn't you? Yes, I did. You got a chance to go to the FFA banquet. That was quite an event from the from the sounds of it and the looks of it here. Yeah, they do a lot of things during the year, and they had a... Um, preview of that for everybody and lots of uh, things that they auctioned off there's a picture of that in the paper of some of the things they auctioned off so yeah they do a lot of activities during the year now i want to highlight another thing mother's day is coming up so happy mother's day millie Thank you. Mom, if you're listening, happy <laughs> Mother's Day in advance. Uh, there's a big smorgasbord that's happening out at the Otter Valley Country Club on Sunday, May 13. And you should uh, call out there and get details from uh, Norma out there. 475-3861 is the phone number. Get the details. They've got four entrees, potatoes and gravy, salad bar, rolls and a drink all together. It saves Saves Mama the trouble to have to cook her own Mother's Day meal, right? And that sounds good. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds good to all the moms listening. I'm sure it sounds good to to you. Um, so I know that you were going to highlight some things about the Night of the Notables. Uh, yes, the fifth graders that are over in Little Rock put this on every year. They've done this for oh four or five years, I think. But the fifth graders take a prominent uh, citizens from below, like George Washington, and one is Amelia Earhart. They research these characters, and then they put together a display board, and they also have a costume. And um, then the Night of the Notables, they put this on for the parents and anyone who would like to attend um and it's held every year in the spring. 
And it's quite an achievement. They do a lot of work there. They have to, they start right after the first of the year and research their notable and get everything ready to go. Well, there's a great page in the paper this week about it. There's an article and a write-up and a group picture. And a lot of the, if not all, a lot of the individual pictures that uh, presented. And some of them have been in the paper Right, they were in weeks. last week. So. so they're not all together, uh, but th- this is another big page of info on that as well. So uh, I also wanted to highlight uh, there's a couple of open houses on the real estate market here in George. Uh, One of them is on Saturday from 930 to 11. That's 411 West Indiana Avenue. And then one of them is on next Tuesday from 530 to 7 p.m. And that's 506 East Dakota Avenue. Both of those are put on by Otter Valley Insurance and Real Estate. Tim DeBrine and the team will take care of of answering those questions for you. They're at 475-3325 here in George, and uh, those details on the open house are in the paper this week. So you want to check that out. Also, Heartland Hardware's got a big uh, big ad about their spring sales event, and, and uh, it is crazy days. You want to get over there to their store. Uh, yesterday I went past there, and they had a big segment of the street even blocked out. They've got a lot of stuff out on the sidewalk sale and some great deals and great values there. Uh, so check it out at Heartland Hardware, and uh, you don't want to miss that. Did you have anything else you were going to highlight? Well, I just want to remind people of the um, hazardous material collection next Monday from 9 to 11. If you have a lot of uh, oh paint supplies or probably uh, pesticides and so forth. You can get rid of those. They'll take them. And then all week long is the cleanup days. So a good chance to clean up the basement or things that you have outside in the garage that you want to get rid of. Uh, It tells in the paper the things that they will accept. And that's um, some dumpsters are put down by the uh, city building down by uh what do i want to call it the well it's kind of behind the the george elevator Elevator. it's in that alleyway behind there that goes all the way out um it's a it's a big long place and most most people will recognize it if they've been there before but yeah so um, it's a good deal get rid of stuff to dispose of some things that you have no use for anymore, and uh, the city will take care of that. It's a big, it's a big deal. So uh, that that kind of covers most of what uh, we were going to cover. I know that the uh, um, the barber shop and the hair hut and personal touch all have ads in the Crazy Days edition. They've all got specials going on this week. Um, the grand opening is going on for Main Therapy down on the corner. What used to be the Corner Cup. And so go check out that new uh, salon and spa down there. You can get your your feet done. (laughs) (laughs) Get ready for summer. (laughs) Get your nails done, your feet done, your hair done, whatever you need down there. Um, And so that's opening. Um, The grand opening is this week. All this week, ton of stuff going on at the Total Stop. Right. Let's talk a little bit about that. Well, uh they're signing up for, you can sign up for the free groceries, and um, they have specials going on in the Total Stop. Yes, there's two two circular ads that are in this week's paper, as well as in-store specials, too right. numerous to mention. Uh, it would take up almost the whole paper to tell you everything that's going on there. It's celebrating their 20th anniversary in Main Street business in George, so I want to, th- again, congratulate Judd and Laura on a 20th year anniversary and they're celebrating that uh, all week long probably even longer than that knowing them they're they're going to uh, find a a way to celebrate that in a big way um, even beyond this week so yeah grocery giveaway they're giving away bags of groceries every day 
And so you can go and sign up every day this week as you're out and about town. Sign up for that grocery giveaway and check out their in-store specials and see everything that's going on. A great hometown grocery store here at the Total Stop. Yeah, we're very fortunate to have such a nice grocery store. It's got everything you need in it. <laughs> if you uh, if you need it, they've got it. If they don't have it, you probably don't need it, right? Or they're willing. <laughs> they could even yeah, they're willing it. to even order special if you have something like in a special spice or something that needs to be. Just ask Laura Judd. They're real accommodating. They are. One other thing to mention at the Total Stop, they've got their uh, graduation party yes. needs list, and they've got uh, special pricing on a lot of those ingredients for graduation parties. Uh, but if you have a need for those things yourself, you'll you'll get the same pricing. So, so check out that ad in the paper this week. This is uh, um, a great time of year. We're turning the corner towards graduation, so... The coming coming edition will be the Mother's Day edition. The following edition of the paper will be graduation, graduation. edition, and there's a lot of uh, a lot of stuff that goes along with that, uh, highlighting the senior class, and a lot of businesses get behind that and want to send their congrats out for that. Uh, Saturday, Friday, and Saturday, we've got some garage sales around town. A couple of them are. Um, advertised in the paper so you want to check out those ads and uh if you're if you're interested in garage sales uh you're gonna have you're gonna have to do a little bit of of uh searching this weekend but (laughs) those are on friday and saturday and again the citywide cleanup will be the following week so um if you don't get it sold at the garage sale you want to still be rid of it you can take it down to the citywide cleanup in that back alleyway by the city storage sheds. Yeah, right. So uh, now we've got, uh, is there anything else that I'm forgetting to mention? Well, I don't think so. I think we've pretty well highlighted most of it. So what we're going to do now, we've got a special interview that I was able to um, interview our county attorney, Shane Mayer, and we've got that on... uh, on tap for the rest of the morning's broadcast so before we go to that we'll do our quote worth quoting sometimes the best thing you can do is not to think not to wonder not to imagine not to obsess but just breathe and have faith that everything will work out for the best that's our quote worth quoting our our weather report from uh, the clarence Stubbe weather bureau our high last week was 84 degrees can you believe that and yeah. on the same day, we had four hundredths of an inch of precipitation. <laughs> yeah, uh, and twenty-one inches of snow in April. That's that's got to be, man. That's got to be a record, doesn't yeah. it? Yeah. <laughs> I think we had more snow, and maybe the worst blizzard I can remember on that on that uh, weekend that everything was canceled. I think that was April fifteen weekend. And man, was there a lot of stuff canceled, and the weather was terrible. And then that following Wednesday, we had another blitzkrieg of snow, and now we're kind of past it, turning the Hopefully. corner, turning the corner towards uh, spring. It almost feels like summer a couple days already. So, and the grain prices: corn for May, June, and July, three sixty four, three sixty six, and three sixty seven. Beans, May, June, and July, 959, 961, and 962. So it's going up a little bit as you head towards July. That's uh, prices as of May 1st, 2 p.m. So uh, thank you for those uh, grain prices. Meals on Wheels, uh, May 1 through 4, Dorothy Bust, Marlene Howard. And May 7 through 11, Brian and Rachel Anderson for Meals on Wheels. Recycling dates May 10 and 24 this month. So... I want to thank you for tuning into this part of the broadcast. Now I'm going to go to uh, already in progress an interview with our county attorney, Shane Mayer. Thanks for listening. This is a great interview and tells a lot about her passion for the job and what she does on a weekly and monthly basis to uh, keep our county safe. We are talking with Shane Mayer, Lyon County's county attorney, about 
the position of county attorney, what it entails, how many facets there are to the job, and many more things. So why don't you fill us in on some of the back details here? Well, I'm the Lyon County Attorney. I've served as the Lyon County Attorney for almost six years. It'll be six years in November. The Lyon County Attorney's Office is in Rock Rapids at the courthouse for the folks that haven't been there. I have been practicing law for almost nine and a half years. I'd have to look back, but about nine and a half years. I primarily have practiced in um, southwest South Dakota and northwest Iowa. I graduated law school from University of South Dakota in... 2009, I'd have to think. It's been, it feels like it's been a very, very long time ago. And I practiced in uh, a couple of small firms in South Dakota prior to coming back to Northwest Iowa. Originally from Northwest Iowa, I'm from May City, a little small town, uh, not too far from here. It's in Osceola County. So. Is this the uh, counterpart to paper from that area? Yes, the Hartley Sentinel. <laughs> yes. I went to high school in Hartley. There you go. Okay. Yes. So that's not very far from here. That's no. uh, You're kind of in your home area mm-hmm. by, by all uh, accounts. And and so that's been a good long time that you've been serving Lyon County as the county attorney. I know that there are many job duties. What kind of requirements does a typical week or maybe a month, if you want to take a general time frame, for the things that repeat mm-hmm. over and over? What kind of job requirements are there for that position? Well, I mean, the actual legal requirements are that you're a resident of Lyon County and that you're licensed in the state of Iowa, good standing, and can practice law. So that's, I guess, the the floor of what it would require. But what my average month would look like is I have two district court days a month, which are your D felonies and above. I have two district associate court days a month, which are all of your indictable felonies. I have two magistrate court days a month, which are your just going to say mostly your traffic tickets. There's some other things that can go with those ma- the the magistrate files, and then I have one juvenile court day a month. That's going to change here soon, and there'll be some combination of the district and the district associate. But generally, that's what my criminal court calendar looks like. But in addition to doing the criminal prosecutions for Lyon County, I handle all the juvenile cases. So all your abuse and neglect cases, all your juvenile delinquencies, your juvenile mental health committals, all of those go through my office, and I'm required by code to handle those. I do all the mental health committals, and so if you have a loved one that you're attempting to have committed, I represent you or the affiants that um, file those affidavits, and I handle those mental health proceedings. Uh, There's actually, uh, that's a... I I don't want to say a large portion of my job, but that's a pretty significant thing. I mean, those are intensive files to work on. I also do all of the real estate for Lyon County. So uh, Lyon County has been working really hard to build bridges and do some some pretty big road projects. And so when those bridge projects come through, I do the easements, the negotiation for the easements, generally just do the real estate transaction on behalf of the county. I do any of the negotiation that has to go when we go into places to, to fix the road, all of that kind of stuff. So some of the civil real estate things that go on with the county. The county the county buys property, sells property. I do all of the the buying and the selling and all of the stuff that goes with that. I also, legally under the code, I'm obligated to advise the Board of Supervisors. And so I am their legal representative. So if they have a legal question that pertains to board business, I'm the one that they come to and I have to give them an opinion. I am the legal representation for all of the department heads in their capacity as an elected official. So I advise them. So that in, gets me into some HR duties that I work for the county. I do all the union negotiations. We have a union. Our secondary road department is a union. And so I do the negotiations for their contract. I've been doing that since I started. I do the truancies. So that's kind of in the juvenile court world. But um, so if, if uh, we have children not going to school and the schools contact me, I'm involved with the family and the school and attempts to get people to go to school. So send your kids (laughs) to school so I don't have to meet and and go over an agreement on how we're going to do that. So that's kind of the general idea of what I do. So on an average day, I could deal with everything from your your run-of-the-mill OWI to a major felony to a mental health committal to uh, an incident with secondary roads to um, someone that's angry about their secondary roads and they call my office. It's kind of the gamut. My office also is responsible for collecting all the monies due and owing the state of Iowa. And so I do have a fine collection program in my office that I've worked really hard to set up, and that takes up a significant amount of time. I have a part-time employee that handles that, 
but there's always the run over for my legal assistant and myself. And so we do the fine collection, we do the restitution, we have a victim witness coordinator that helps me coordinate witnesses and victims for trials. I'll talk about a uh, multitasker. You mm-hmm. have to be a bit of the uh, ability to wear multiple hats and switch them on and off pretty fast, it sounds like. Well, and I've learned that if I have a headset, so I have a headset on, so I'm really glad. I have a headset on in the office so I can be walking around talking to people, grabbing files, and that that's helped. That's been a lifesaver. My secretary finally said, we're getting you a headset because I'm always yelling into the phone or at the phone on speakerphone. And so then I got a Bluetooth, which was a really big step. So now if I'm out running, I can still be on the phone dealing with county business while I'm out for my run or my bike ride. So that's been great. (laughs) That's good. Well, a lot of different components to that job, a lot of facets to that stone, you might say. You've alluded to some of these some of these facets, some of these components to the job. What are what are some of the um, biggest problems facing Lyon County from a legal standpoint right now that you have to deal with? Oh, well, in general, I'm just going to make a general statement and not just necessarily the Lyon County. And I think you and I talked a little bit about this, that in general, I think the biggest challenge we face, not just as Lyon County citizens, but just as citizens in general, is the breakdown of our families and sort of what I call the moral decay that's going on around us. And so we have a lot of work to do surrounding that. And that affects not just myself and law enforcement, but all the folks that work in the county and all of us together. But a sub-piece of that is probably um, addiction. We have a drug problem. Every county has a drug problem. Uh, Methamphetamine is still one of the most prevalent drugs in Iowa. We're still, I think, on some sort of list as one of the states that has a methamphetamine problem, and meth affects a lot of what I do. Addiction affects a lot of what I do, whether it's the juvenile delinquencies or the abuse and neglect cases or your run-of-the-mill OWI. There's usually uh, an addiction base to it, and I think I shared with you the quote that I, I, I heard from Judge Pearsall once that he's very rarely met truly evil people, uh, but addiction, people that struggle with addiction and they get themselves into a whole lot of other situations. But I would say addiction, uh, funding, everybody's fighting over dollars. Mental health is something that I think we've all been hearing about in the national and even some of the state news. We have issues with how we're going to fund and and provide services to these people. So I would say those are some of the the big ticket topics. So if you had to expound on on the drug problem, it's more it's more of an addiction problem than a specific drug, right? I mean, it could be Many types of different drugs could be in that category, or alcohol, or Mm -hmm. as you've alluded to, OWI. It's kind of that whole gamut from the the simplest offense, if you will, or simplest. More run-of-the-mill, right. All the way up to. uh, Some significant felony offenses. So it's not just possession of drugs. You have to deal with people. Manufacturing. Manufacturing, distribution. So all of those things are a part of that problem, right? So. How many, how many ways does that make manifest in just what you deal with? It's many, many ways, I would say. Oh, I mean, all the way from from folks that are convicted of a drug offense, even if it's a, a possession, losing their driver's license, and then they can't pay their fine to get their license back, and then they get pulled over because they don't have a driver's license, and they can't get their kids to school. So then we're into some of those other issues. The issues with addiction, whether it's alcohol, meth, Uh, The opiates, I will tell you that we are seeing more and more, and I've seen heroin now. I mean, so Uh I think that that's coming. That opiate crisis that started a while ago, we're starting to feel the effects of that. I would share that Lyon County has joined a national lawsuit against some of the large pharmaceutical companies to at least send a message that this is important and this crisis is important. While I can't give you a monetary amount that it's affected Lyon County, it has affected us. Uh I mean, and the cost of treatment for those folks is very expensive, and we're starting to see that because we're all going to start sharing and shouldering the costs of all that. So it affects everything, whether you have someone burglarizing a business or a residence to get money to go buy drugs, that drug piece is still there. I mean, that's still part of what's going on. And it's such a strong addiction that it transcends the the logic required of absolutely i will do what i need to do to get the money to get the drugs absolutely i heard it very recently that the prescription amount of the opioids going into the american public is the equivalent of 30 pills per 
every person on in the United States. And wow. uh, and so that is, is a lot of that being prescribed. And I know that it's an effective form of pain relief, as an example. Mm-hmm. But there is a now a groundswell of there's got to be a better way, mm-hmm. which I think Lyon County has signed on to the. We just need to have the discussion. And then people need to be really aware of what they're getting into when they take lawfully prescribed opiates. Because like you said, they do have a good use behind them. And I think um, from what I can understand and, and some of the literature I've read, it really started with the idea that how do we provide quality, humane end-of-life care for people that are in chronic pain, people that are, you know, in hospice. And when we see how effective that is, I think you can argue that the pharmaceutical companies thought, wow, this is a great market. These drugs work really well. Um, they're really effective. And now we have a problem. And mm-hmm. so... And, and there's different studies out there, but one of the studies that I've, I've read recently talks about that the average person on opiate, so you have knee surgery, the average person after seven days is addicted. So you're lawfully taking your opiates, whatever that is, um, for your knee because you had knee surgery, and after seven days, you're hooked. You got hooked lawfully. Mm-hmm. And then that just spirals out of, I mean, it's just it's, it's a spiral effect. And so... I think people just need to be really aware of it. We need to have those discussions with your doctors, with your mm-hmm. loved one that has the knee surgery, um, because it's just it's simply not a good situation for those folks. So it's not just the the obvious criminally negligent types of drugs. It's, Absolutely. You could have it legitimately prescribed, and it can be just as, as addictive, Absolutely. just as problematic in the legal system mm-hmm. eventually. Absolutely. That all leads to... The fact that once somebody does commit a crime, if it's a, a side result of a drug addiction of any right. kind, if somebody commits a crime and then there, then it comes to a sentencing and then mm-hmm. a uh, a plea bargain that's less than the sentence and all of those things. Sure. Can you describe for our listeners uh, the concept of uh, indeterminate? sentencing and how that works. I would love to because indeterminate sentencing is something that most people that I encounter uh, usually comes up with victims don't understand the sentencing scheme in Iowa. So for felonies, with the exception of an OWI felony, third offense, for felonies we have what's called indeterminate sentencing in Iowa. And so that means, I'm going to make you a burglar for a minute. So you burglarize a house, it's a D felony, okay? You plead guilty, we're at sentencing. So the way that it would look is you'd have a defense attorney. He may make a recommendation. Um, your supervising parole officer would interview you and prepare a report for the court. He would make a sentencing recommendation. And obviously, the, as a state, I can make a recommendation as well. But really, the two options on the table for you, if you're going to plead guilty and be found guilty of this D felony, is an indeterminate sentence not to exceed five years or probation. That's the option. So the court, unlike... South Dakota, our neighbor state, doesn't have the option to say, you know, I think Craig needs 180 days in jail, or I think Craig needs two years in jail before he's eligible for parole. There's no in-between. The judge has probation, indeterminate sentence not to exceed five years, okay? So let's just say he throws the book at you, indeterminate sentence not to exceed five years, and that's what you're sentenced to. So it sounds like it's five years of prison, right? But that's really kind of not accurate because if they send you to the indeterminate sentence not to exceed five years, the Board of Parole gets to decide how much of that indeterminate sentence you're going to serve. So they determine the indeterminate. So you may go down to the Board of Parole and go through the process and be eligible for parole in six months. And the board may say, we're going to let you out. And I think people don't quite understand that. They see these people get the five-year sentences or even some of the 10-year sentences on um, drug distribution offenses, and they're going, why are these people back in my community? They've only been gone for 12 months. Well, it's because it's the indeterminate sentence, and the Board of Parole gets to make that call. I obviously can communicate with the Board of Parole. I have done that on some specific offenses, and they can weigh that. But ultimately what uh, I think people are surprised to hear, prisons are full. They're not holding nonviolent offenders. I went to a meeting, and it's been a couple of years ago, of the County Attorneys Association, and we had a Board of Parole officer come and speak to us. And that poor guy, 
I felt so bad for him by the time he got <laughs> out of there because he had 99 elected county attorneys and their assistants just hopping mad because we're asking the same questions that voters are asking me as I'm out campaigning. What's going on? And it wasn't a pleasant conversation for him, but ultimately he basically summed it up. Who do you want in your prisons? Because we have limited resources, limited space. We can either build more prisons, which we're going to have to increase taxes to do, which nobody seems to want, or we're going to have to make some calls. And we're telling judges that you get to choose. You can send Greg the burglar, the nonviolent offender, or your nonviolent low-level drug user, not the distributor, not necessarily the, the, the manufacturer, or we can house your violent sex offenders, your predators, your murderers, your folks committing violent offenses against human beings. And I think we all know, as we're sitting mm-hmm. in the room, as angry as we were, we're going, well, I guess if we have to make that choice, I, I know where I sit on that. And so I think people are frustrated, and I understand that frustration, and I, I share it. But that's really what we're up against because of the resources that we have and the indeterminate sentencing scheme that we have. So another thing that we can do as prosecutors is for drug possession offenses, not the people selling the drugs, not the people making the drugs, but people possessing drugs, we can amend felonies to aggravated misdemeanors or lower-level misdemeanors, in which case the sentencing judge has more discretion to sentence them to county jail time, which is more effective. Uh, Because for drug addicts, there is very little to no treatment available at the state pen. None. So you're sending these people down there. They're going to be out in a matter of months. They're returning to your community, arguably no better than when we sent them, as far as an addiction purpose is. And so that's something to consider. And those are factors that I consider when we make charging decisions, when we make plea decisions. Those are factors that the judge and probation consider when they make their recommendations to the judge. What are we doing? How are we going to bigger picture address what's going on here? Um, And so some of those things from the outside seem counterintuitive, but when you think about it, it, it makes more sense. The other thing that we find is a lot of these folks that we're sending to jail don't have health insurance. They're on Medicaid. And uh, my understanding is after, uh, I believe it's 30 days uh, incarcerated, you you lose your Medicaid benefits. And so then we, the Lyon County taxpayer, are on the hook for those folks' medical expenses. And as you might know, some of these folks have some pretty serious, significant medical expenses. And so we have to make a choice. Is it so important that that particular low-level offender sit a significant amount of county time? In some cases, the answer is absolutely. In some cases, it's going, we got to have a balance. We, do we want to pay for this person's significant medical costs because they're going to sit here for six months? Sometimes. Or do we need to come up with another path? The Lyon County Jail has done a great job of making available to folks that want it uh, substance abuse evaluations and mental health evaluations with the hopes that we can get them hooked into services. I've worked really hard with the Northwest Iowa Care Connections, which is our regional mental health district, and I can talk a little bit about how mental health works because it's changed significantly since I became county attorney. But we're really trying to figure out ways to um, stop the repeat customers, address the problem at its core, because we know we're going to see them again. You're going to see them again. They're going to be back in our communities, um, and the goal is to, you know, prevent that. And sometimes the way to prevent that is punitive sentence. Um, I have tried a number of cases. I, I don't have my, my little fact sheet here with the, the data, but had a number of jury trials. I'm really proud of that. I like trying cases. Uh, jury trials are rather expensive, um, and so it's something that needs to be used uh, with some consideration when there just can't be a resolution reached, and I've had those cases where they just have to be tried. You don't win them all, but I'm proud of the ones that I have tried. I'm proud of the the ones that I've tried on behalf of victims. I think it's mattered to them, so I'm grateful for those experiences. There's a lot of moving pieces, I guess, to answer your question in summary. A lot of moving pieces to sentencing. The reason we have plea deals to kind of dovetail into perhaps maybe that area is because we simply can't try every case. I have Mm -hmm. six district jury trials a year. The judges are short-staffed, and so they're very uh, – you need to get stuff resolved. Sometimes things can't be resolved, and you have to have a trial, and I'm willing to do that, and I have done that. But sometimes that's why things have to be resolved with plea deals. And plea deals, I've noticed as I've been campaigning, have 
have hit people with maybe a negative connotation. But mm-hmm. the reality is uh, that that's how the criminal justice system functions. And arguably, it's not as efficient now as it could be. But if we were to not negotiate and if people weren't offered incentives to admit guilt and adjudicate their case, the system would collapse. Anybody that's tried to get a civil court date in Lyon County knows docket's full. So, Well, and it would be pushed out how many months to get oh. a court date, six to eight months some, in some it cases? It would really just depend on the, the nature of the case, mm-hmm. but it, it could be a number of months, yes. And then, and then while you're waiting for that, they have to be somewhere. And mm-hmm. sometimes that might have to be in a, in a county jail or in a, in a place where the community perceives it to be safe. Yep. And I was talking about civil cases, but right. to talk to you about um, where people go while their case is being uh, resolved, um, one place is the county jail. They could be held on bond. Another thing I, I've, I've found that I want people to understand is I'm not a magistrate, so I don't get to determine what the bond is for folks that commit offenses. And so if someone comes into the jail, they're seen by a magistrate who is a judge who gets to determine two things. Is that person a flight risk? Or are they a danger to the public? And based on those two things, they set a bond. And the person posts that bond, they get to leave. They can set a number of conditions to ensure those two things. And so a lot of times people think that uh, people are just bonding out of jail all over the place. Well, yes, um, because a magistrate, someone other than myself, has made a determination as to those two things. And I will tell you, we don't always agree, the magistrates and I, on those two things. And when we don't agree, there's things that I can do to um, call them back into court and say, hey, we need that. We need to relook at this. But that's another moving piece of how people get hooked into the system. That is a fascinating part of the process. That doesn't always work like it does on TV, right? With oh. the lawyer, the lawyer <laughs> no. shows on TV. No, not everything's resolved in an hour. That's for sure. <laughs> That's right. And, and 15 minutes of commercials Absolutely. notwithstanding, right? Yes. Um, so, so sometimes people's perception of the sentencing versus the plea mm-hmm. bargain isn't, isn't always quite what it actually mm-hmm. is. And so I, I appreciate you speaking to that. The overarching thing that I'm that I'm hearing here is the uh, amount of dedication it must take to to do this job every day. Can you speak to that from your own perspective? I can because prior to coming here I, I um, had some prosecutorial experience. I did a four-year internship with U.S. Attorney's Office in Sioux City and I was also their law clerk for a couple of years while I was in law school. So I had some idea of what it was to be a prosecutor so to speak and I came from private practice and worked with businesses and, and clients and, and that kind of thing. But being a one, uh, one office county attorney or one solo practitioner county attorney requires you to be kind of a uh, doer of all things, master of none. A jack of, none, of all trades. Master yeah. of none. And that's really what it is. I mean, on a daily basis, it's just it could be so random. I could have a major felony trial that I'm getting ready for while at the same time dealing with an incident where we have an angry landowner over land deal and then get a phone call that – uh, somebody's uh, child needs to be mentally committed, and at the same time, we've got a wrecked patrol car, and we need to talk <laughs> about who's going to pay for the wrecked patrol car and and navigate all of those different things while collecting fines, advising the board, maintaining HR. It's just a lot of stuff, and so it's it's been a challenge. I've been really grateful for it. It's made me a better lawyer. It's just made me an all-around better citizen because you have to work with a lot of people. You have to get to know people in all the communities, and you have to sit down with them. We work with the cities, when the county and the cities have things that are going on. We have to talk about that, and it requires you to sit down and do a lot of listening, and that's been good. That is definitely a, a part that I that I take as I hear you uh, talk about this is your thing. This is what you yeah. what you want to do and what you're good at and how you want to live your life is by providing this service to the county mm-hmm. and uh and that is that's good to hear somebody when they are passionate about something that they're doing that's good if you wouldn't mind taking a little sidetrack i heard something that had happened in the lyon county office about a whole bunch of evidence and back evidence oh, and back sure. cases can you 
Can you Absolutely. tell our listeners a little bit about that project? Yes, I can. So when I started here, I had a methamphetamine manufacturing trial. It was my first real big jury trial in Lyon County, and I went to the sheriff's office because my intention was I wanted to admit the lab into evidence. And what I mean is, is the components that make the meth lab, I wanted to be able to show the jury what it looked like, and those are pieces. And so we had gone into this house and did a search, and there was just hundreds of pieces of evidence. And I remember knowing what I was looking for because I had gone along with law enforcement to the search and was there. And so at least I had some mental idea of where some of the stuff was. And so we get ready or about three weeks out, like I want to see my lab so I can mark exhibits and, and figure out the paperwork part of that. And I get to the sheriff's office and we were in the ambulance garage and they've done a ton of work over there. So it's completely different now. But at the time they had sort of an overflow of their evidence locker was in the ambulance garage. And there they had laid out all of this stuff, and there was no rhyme or real reason to it. We were uh, bagging things in sunshine food bags, and I went, ooh, we can do better. And they all agreed with me, <laughs> and probably because uh, we rebagged everything, and we went through it together and spent a lot of time getting ready for that trial so we could present it. And they went, yeah, we can definitely improve this process. So what we discovered is, is that Lyon County, much like many small counties or small agencies, everybody's just kind of done their own thing for so long. And so there wasn't a standard operating procedure of how are we going to seize evidence, return evidence when we're done with it, store it, track it, and keep it the way we need to for purposes of trial, for purposes of preservation, and all of those things. And so we really had what I would call... Um, the closet theory of evidence. And so what we did was, is if we seized a piece of evidence, we just put it in our closet, kind of like your closet at home when you just keep putting stuff in there. And at some point, you got to open the closet, and you're like, oh, whoa, shut the closet door. I don't want to look again. (laughs) That's kind of what we had. And uh, the sheriff's office uh, and I sat down and said, what can we do to make this better? And we did a lot of research. I had an intern that was instrumental. Uh, We went through and we logged every piece of evidence in the sheriff's office. And we cross-referenced that with all of the files, even the closed files in my office. And we figured out which pieces of evidence which went with which case. We returned evidence. Um, And not only did we just clean the closet out, we figured out a way that we're never going to have this type of issue again. And so now we have an electronic tracking system. Uh, We have evidence custodians that strictly handle the evidence and um, understand how that's going to work. We have an in-and-out check procedure. Um, So chain of custody is the way that it's supposed to be, and I'm really, really proud of that because when I go meet with other county attorneys, I'm vice president of the County Attorneys Association, and so I get to go meet with other county attorneys, and we talk about best practices, about what can we do to help other county attorneys implement best practices, and I get to talk about how we did this sort of on our own. I mean, the state didn't have to come in and say do it. We just decided we can do this much better, and we are, and it's, it's been very successful, so... That is uh, evidence. Sometimes, um, sometimes it's important to someone, right? Too, as after a trial is over, maybe mm-hmm. they want their widget back. Correct. And now you know where it is, right? Yep. Now and now you, we have your widget. And now right. you can, when it's past the need for being evidence, now it can be property again for the Correct. person who lost it, maybe in a burglary or. There's. Correct. I can think of many ways that that that's been an important thing, not just to your office, Mm -hmm. but to many people who had evidence tied up in that closet theory for, for a while. So Mm -hmm. that, that's kind of a, that's kind of an important component to that. I think that's a, uh, a a big accomplishment for any attorney's office to have a, Mm -hmm. a, a really good form of dealing with evidence. And I really applaud the sheriff's office for looking at that and going, we can do better. I mean, that's a tough thing to do is to look at your your practices and go, we haven't been doing it the best that we can. And I applaud them for, you know, being able to stand there and go, we're going to do this differently. That's tough. That is a, that is a big, a big feather in the cap of the sheriff's office Mm -hmm. to do that. Let's turn the corner a little bit. What kind of important cases are you dealing with in the attorney's office that are coming up or maybe that you've recently mm-hmm. finished that speak to your sort of resume? It's it's tough because I, I don't like to comment on specific cases just because, particularly if they're still pending, because that can cause a lot of, of rules and the rules are really long and I don't really want to read them. So if I say nothing, <laughs> it just it just keeps me in the clear. But we do have a number of felony cases that are coming up for jury trial this summer. I have a trial on May 15th. 
and I'm excited about those cases. There's some victims involved, and I'm excited that they're going to get their day in court, and a lot of work has gone into those files. So Yeah, that's enough, enough said about those. You don't have to get into sure. the specifics on that. Now, as we sort of round the corner towards home here, what do you think the most important thing for people in Lyon County to know or understand about you? That I'm one of the hardest working people I think that I know. Does that sound too much? Is that too much? I don't know. <laughs> um, I work really, really hard because the job is really important. This process is important. This position is important. Uh, this isn't just a job to me. This is a chosen profession. When I chose to be a lawyer, I, I it, beca- it was my profession. I worked really hard to get through law school, and this is what I do. This is my life. I've shared with people that I'm kind of a nerd. I just got the internet like a week ago, so I don't. <laughs> uh, which which sounds odd, but I really do. This is what I do. I mean, I work a lot. I like to put in a lot of hours. I'm here. I'm committed. I think a lot of people have seen my car in front of the courthouse on weekends. I'm there on holidays. I try to be available to the public because it's important. And so I'm also very committed to my community. I live in Rock Rapids. I've been involved in a number of things in Rock Rapids because that's important to me to to be involved in my community and to take part in that stuff. I'll I'll give you the the last word for any closing remarks that you might have. I want to give people a little bit that I am a human being, and I do. <laughs> some people wonder. No, I really am a human being. Um, just a little bit about me, just some some personal stuff. I have a couple of dogs that are really important to me. That people know me around town. I've got a really big mastiff. So if you've seen the the movie Turner and Hooch, I have a hooch, um, and so I really enjoy that. I enjoy running and biking. So people are always out seeing me riding my bike and running, and that's something I enjoy doing. I'm usually listening to some podcast while I'm doing it, but. Um, yeah, but in conclusion, it's been a privilege to be the Lyon County attorney. It really has. And I really uh, appreciate you giving me the opportunity to talk to folks because I enjoy doing that. And so this has been really fun to be able to do that. And I would just ask that everybody vote on June 5th and I appreciate everyone's support. That's great. That's great. Well, again, this has been, uh, Lyon County's County attorney, Shane Mayer, talking about many facets of the job and some of the some of the unseen moving parts of the machinery. I appreciate you taking the time to visit with us here today and uh, talk to our listeners about what you do and how you do it. So thank you so much for coming. Thank you for having me. It's been a great, great time, and uh, we wish you every success on the election that is on June June 5th. Vote in the primary. Vote in the primary. Vote for whoever you like. Right? Sure, or... absolutely. I, I, <laughs> I tell you what, I'm grateful that I live in a place where we have elections and we can we can have these discussions. That's right. That's what it's about. So definitely uh, get out and vote on June 5. That will be a part of the process. The primary vote is June 5. Correct. Right? So. Yep, it is. All right. Thank you very much for being here. Thank you. Yes, that was Shane Mayer talking about the county attorney position and want to thank her for the interview and for answering that many question list of things to talk about. Uh, you've been tuned in here to Lyon County's local news, lyoncountynews.com and the radio edition. I uh, want to thank our special guest again, County Attorney Shane Mayer, and want to wish you every success on Main Street in George. The last bit of crazy days here, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday yet, four days of crazy days. Come on down and uh, check out all the great deals on Main Street. Uh, I want to thank our friends at Casey's for the delicious raspberry flips and wonderful donuts this morning as we brought this broadcast to you. Thank you very much for that. Uh, On behalf of Cheryl and Millie, Cheryl is back from assignment. We're going to have some great pictures of the the, uh, students seeing the ambulance and all of the great stuff that goes on there as they explain what they do. We're going to have a lot of great pictures of that in an upcoming edition of the Lyon County News. And as always, on the internet, lyoncountynews.com. Tune us in each Thursday morning at 9.30 as we bring some of the bits of the local news to you. Again, this is Craig Johnson. On behalf of Millie Krull and Cheryl Korselman, I want to thank you for tuning in. Our Volume 112, Number 18, Episode 5, of the Lyon County News. See you next week, everybody.